Hi students and welcome to this uh, mini lecture on time-based media and sculpture. I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible. We'll start with some learning objectives as always. So we'll start by talking about um, the relief versus sculpture in the round as two kind of um, modes of uh, sculpture. And then we'll talk about techniques like carving and molding as methods of creating sculptures. Uh, the casting process will also be covered very quickly. We'll focus on the, la the last wax process in particular and look at um, African art. And um, then we're going to look at uh, installations and earthworks uh, as types of environments that artists make and then of course can also call sculptural. And lastly, and uh, perhaps less traditionally, we'll talk about the body um, and how artists have used their bodies at, in performance art as a type of sculpture. So um, we'll start at, at the top. Um, when, you, when we think about sculpture, we really can think of two processes. One is subtractive and one is additive. So subtractive meaning that the sculptor is taking something away. So the image over on the left side here, this is where the sculptor, the sculptor works with material larger than what they think they want the finished work to be. And then they take away in this instance, uh, obviously the artist Michelangelo is carving away at the mass, which is a giant stone. Um, until the form is achieved. You can see right here, this is an unfinished piece. And the other uh, type, uh, other process that you have is additive. So it's the opposite of subtractive. Here, this is where artists are adding um, things together, assembling them, bringing them together to create an artwork. So this process is where the artist builds the work from added materials. So just to give you more of an understanding of uh, what that, uh, what I mean by that, here we have again subtractive. This is Atlas Slave by Michelangelo. You probably know him because he is famous for um, many artworks among the, the David that you see here at the end of the hallway. Um, this is in the Galleria della Accademia in Florence, Italy. Um, this is kind of the center of the Italian Renaissance, and you can find the sculpture, uh, sculpture there. Um, but if you go into the gallery, it's at the end of a long corridor in which you also have a variety of other unfinished sculptures by Michelangelo. And you can see, I love these though, because you really do see the process of art making and sculpting itself. And you, it really uh, uh, helps us to understand the, um, the process of taking away, right? Chipping away at that stone to get the form. And we will talk about the uh, Michelangelo's piece, uh, the David, later in the class when we talk about the Renaissance period during the art history kind of section of this class. Um, so we will get to the uh, additive process in a little bit, um, but now I wanted to talk about three forms of sculptural space. So sculptures intrude into the viewer's space in a few ways. One is as a relief, one is in the round, which we just looked at, and then another is as an environment. And of course, performance art we'll I'll talk about as well in a little bit, where we will think about living sculptures, or bodies, performers who are using their bodies as a sculpted kind of material. So first let's talk about relief. Now this is a key term. A carved relief sculpture has three dimensional depth, but it's only meant to be viewed frontally, from the front, right? From one side typically. So here you have the stele of Naram Sin. Um, this was found in modern day Iran. Uh, it's ancient art. You can see it's from the year 2000, 254 to 2218 BCE. And just for those of you who are unsure what that means, we basically talk about two time, um, period, not periods, but uh, we uh, um, divide um, history into uh, BCE and CE. And um, in academia, we uh, BCE stands for before the common era, that is before year zero, and then year zero, everything beyond that is of the common era, so we call it CE. Um, in some religious communities, uh, they would call this um, BC before Christ and then AD after death. Uh, but in academia, we use this. So that means this is two, oh, this is 2000, uh, uh, 254 years before year zero. And of course now today we are at 2021 years after year zero. So really, really ancient. 
Um, this, would, this would be called um, mostly low relief. That means that the sculpted parts of this are only coming off of the flat surface a little bit. They're, they're very shallow, um, shallowly carved off of the surface. Um, so we have low relief here. And if you look at the piece, I won't really focus all that much on any of the pieces we're looking at today because this is really broadly about sculpture and getting to the terms. Um, but this piece um, is actually um, brings up another really cool key term that does come up over this uh, over the course of um, this class, which is hierarchic scale. Um, so this is actually created and like many works at this time in the service of a king or a ruler. So this is the stele of Naram Sin. He was the ruler um, of, of um, uh, Sipar at the time. And can you, uh, if you were in class with me, I'd ask you, who do you think it is? And many of you would probably say, probably the giant guy who's climbing up the mountain, right? Yes, that is Naram Sin. Um, and you, I didn't have to tell you that, you just knew it. Probably because it makes sense that if you're making an artwork of yourself and you're the ruler and you think quite highly of yourself, you might represent yourself as really large. Is the largest person way bigger than everyone else? Was he really bigger than everyone else? Of course not. He was probably the exact same size as them. Um, but this is called, uh, this is a, a, a device, a pictorial device that was used and is, has been used throughout the course of history to denote importance. So who's the most important? The king. And he's represented as largest. He's really easy to find. He's also central, right? So we can tell uh, where he is right away. This is called hierarchic scale. So there's an hierarchy, a hierarchy here of the scale of the figures, meaning how big they are. And if we look closely, we can see that actually there's a slight bit of high relief used here as well. So if low relief means that um, things that are carved just slightly off the surface, high relief means things that are carved, you know, high off the surface, almost to become in the round, which is to say that you can, they're almost carved all the way in full uh, 360. Um, you can see here, obviously, that this is kind of seen as being a low relief piece. Um, but just to be able to bring up the second term high relief, you can see his elbow is almost fully carved. Um, so there's parts of it where, you know, obviously um, the people who are dying in front of him, his enemies are carved very, very low relief and parts of his body are a little bit higher. Um, however, of course, they're, they're, if you look at high relief pieces more broadly, they're much um, different than this, but this is a way to get at the high relief as a term as well. And that brings us to sculpture in the round. So uh, the, these are not relief sculptures. These are sculptures that are meant to be viewed in the round. So that means you can walk around them. Freestanding sculptures demand movement of the viewer. So they're including, including you and I as viewers. We have to actually physically move our bodies in, able to, uh, in order to fully see the piece, which is kind of exciting and fun um, as a viewer. This is called the capture of the Sabine women. Um, and let me actually bring you to my next picture first. Um, you can see exactly where it is. This is in Florence as well. And again, we'll talk about Florence as the center of the Italian Renaissance during the, Renaissance, uh, during the 1500s and 1500s in Italy uh, later in the course. Um, but you'll find a lot of these um, important humanist sculptures were created at this time. Um, and this is in a really important um, place in Florence. Um, this kind of outdoor social gathering space, a plaza, uh, they call them palazzos. Um, this is the, at the Palazzo Publico. So um, you can see how large it is and you can see you're able to walk. It's kind of on the edge of a porch that you can walk into and you can walk all the way around it. Um, and the figures literally spiral as you go up. Um, so you, none of them are actually facing you at one time. So it's really, really cool. It does kind of force you to walk around to really study all the figures at once. Um, this is actually, I said I wasn't gonna go into any of these pieces, but um, this is actually based on a, 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 an important story of early Rome, where um, the early Romans were said to have needed more women um, to grow their population. Um, this is right around the founding of Rome. And so a nearby city to Rome is called Sabine. Um, and so the story goes that the men, the Roman men went to capture women from this 
other city and then brought them back um, uh, um, and just basically took them. Um, so this is um, to bring them back to Rome, you know, make wives out of them, impregnate them, uh, grow the population. And then of course now, and then now we all know Rome is this kind of amazing superpower. Um, but this was the story of or the early founding of Rome is that it was based on kind of um, going to other towns and taking women. Um, you know, this uh, is an interesting story to talk about. Um, other scholars have called this the rape of the Sabine women. Um, that can be kind of triggering and it's not clear if these women actually uh, were running away or uh, some historians have talked about the fact that it's very likely that many women were excited to make the move to Rome and become Roman wives because Rome was seen as kind of a growing metropolis. So it's an interesting thing. All history has its own kind of quirks to it and interesting stories, but that has to do with this one here. But nonetheless, this is getting us to think about sculpture in the round as a, a, a device for um, sculptors to really make the, uh, the composition matter um, so that the, subject, uh, the subjects move in a circular fashion, in a spiral fashion here, and then of course the viewer has to move in a similar fashion. Um, this is what we call carving. So this is one of the types of uh, uh, devices for creating a sculpture that we'll cover today. You all probably know this material is just carved away, chipped away, gouged away using a hammer. Uh, you know, this is raw material, usually a block of stone. Um, different types of stones are used. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've uh, you've um, heard of this type of uh, sculpting before. Uh, we will uh, look back in history a little bit for the moment to go all the way back to ancient Egypt. Um, all of these sculptures are in the round. All of them have been carved and so they are subtractive. Um, but look at the human figures. And I love this, uh, putting these next to one another because you can really see over time how there's a real interest uh, in a move away from kind of the solid block form of the stone that's being carved um, to kind of an interest in naturalism of the body and um, a move away from that solidity. Um, so here we have the ancient Egyptians who were really interested in ge geometry, geometric shapes, right angles, you know, they had um, kind of a, um, um, a, a series of measurements for creating the human body um, so that it would be perfect in every way. Um, does anyone actually look like this? No, no, uh, we don't look like that, right? Uh, we're not that rigid. We, you know, it's very idealized is what we call that. And you'd even call these guys idealized as well, right? These are the idealized human bodies. These are not naturalistic. Um, but over time, you do, do see more of an interest in facial features, hair being depicted. Of course, we know the Egyptians wore wigs, um, but hair being depicted, facial features being depicted, lips, a muscle being depicted, as you see here, as we move forward to Greece uh, and Athens, and the Critias boy, where you have for the first time a real interest in naturalism and the body and the way that you and I actually would stand. And then we move forward to what we, as uh, probably the most famous, um, a kind of big transition in the history of sculpture, and that is the Dermiferous. This is a sculpture that was created by a mathematician and kind of Renaissance man uh, who was living, um, a, um, who is a Roman. Um, his name was Polycletus. And because he was a mathematician, he created a series of mathematical figures that go along with creating the uh, perfectly proportioned human body. Uh, and at this time in history, in Greek history, Greeks were really, really um, interested in uh, bodily perfection. Um, you know, this is where they have the first Olympics, right? Um, how can we show that we are um, just as beautiful as the gods, right? Our bodies can be this way too. Um, and so here you have an interest in the art world as well in depicting the human body as perfect. And so he created what he called the classical canon. Uh, he developed a set of rules for idealized human figures. And so basically this is all based on measurements. So um, he actually wrote a book called The Canon where you can look and find measurements for artists to follow if they're sculpting the human body. Um, so it's supposed to be very ideal, very perfect. And we also have the use really for the first time 
the actual use of what we call contrapposto. Contrapposto is basically this relaxed look where you have the counterbalance relationship between a weight-bearing leg and a relaxed leg. Uh, and then, of course, uh, a relaxed arm and a bent arm uh, centered around a central axis, uh, axis at the spine. So this is how you and I actually stand, right? It's If I were standing up right now with like an Egyptian and I was really straight, right? You'd be like, what's wrong with you? Um, this actually shows us a, a relaxed way of standing. This is how you and I stand. We don't stand like the Egyptians, right? We're not stiff standing there. Uh, we bend one leg, we move our weight from side to side. So this was the first time in history that um, artists understood that that is the best way um, to naturally depict a human. So Duriferous, really important when we see this big shift over obviously a long period of time, um, 2000 years, um, but over time there's just always a real interest, especially for the Greeks in the ideal human body in sculpture. Um, now let's move to China and talk about modeling. Um, modeling is an additive process. So we're going to look at a couple additive works. This is one of them. So there, this is where you have what you think of as, you might think of as ceramics. You, some of you might have taken a ceramics class in high school, uh, where applied substance, usually clay, is then molded. So this is additive because you can add, I mean, in some ways the ceramic process um, can be additive and um, um, additive and um, subtractive because you can carve away at it, um, but usually you, you are adding, uh, you know, little details when you're molding clay. Uh, the Chinese were masters of this technique, masters of the ceramic arts, um, and this is most probably exem exemplified in the warriors here at the tomb of the uh, one particular em emperor, Xin Shu Huang, who basically had uh, people uh, mold 6,000 life-size figures of soldiers and horses, basically to be bodyguards at his tomb after he died. So this is his mausoleum. Um, um, there's uh, also 40,000 real bronze weapons, real life-size chariots that were found here as well. So this is all meant to protect him in the afterlife. Um, and if you look closely, it's really, really cool because they are all individualized. Um, and it's said that he brought in just thousands and thousands and thousands of people to create these 6,000 figures and that they were created in a matter of a few years. Um, so really, really cool. Look at how specific their clothing, their facial features, their hairstyles all are. And now let's talk for a bit about casting. Uh, for here, I want to actually talk about African artists. Africans were uh, hi historically have a very rich history of um, sculptural casting. Casting involves a mold into which molten material is then poured and allowed to harden. So this is another one that can be both additive and subtractive. Um, bronze, brass, or other materials are usually um, poured into a mold. This is what the process really looks like. Um, so, and this, as I said at the beginning, this is the lost wax casting process. So it's a method of casting metal such as bronze, and you see the picture over here on this side of the uh, screen. A wax mold is covered in clay. And so, of course, you're making a wax mold, you know, you're carving away at a, mat, a wax block, probably. That's, that's um, subtractive, right? And then you're covering that in clay. Okay, that's additive and plaster. Then you're firing that, which means you're putting it in a really hot oven. You're melting the, and by doing that, you melt the wax on the inside, leaving an empty hole, right? Because wax melts. So you leave an empty hole of what you've carved in the wax. And then you have this empty hole. And you can see in step number five, you pour a molten metal that, uh, into the hollow space. It's a hot metal. Um, and then you let it cool. And when it cools, you crack the outside shell, right, that clay, off, and then you have this beautiful hardened um, solid metal form that remains. So really a cool process because it is also um, additive and negative and um, subtractive. Um, the Africans uh, were known uh, in the Edo period to focus on the head. There's a lot of uh, sculptures of what we call the Oba uh, in Edo uh, culture in Nigeria, um, at the court of Benin. You, the Oba is the king, and um, this is supposed to be the head of the king. 
And the head was seen at this time as being the most important part of the body, which is different, right? For us, we think of it perhaps as the heart because that is what keeps us, you know, it's always beating, right? Um, but for them, uh, the head was seen as the most sacred place of the body. And so a lot of times you see uh, African um, castings of uh, heads. Um, the head houses the brain, and that was seen as the most sacred part, uh, the most sacred thing, um, at least within this period in the Edo culture. Now let's talk about assemblage. Um, and this is, would be what we call additive, um, because um, this is, as you can see, flowers that were added to a framework made by the artist. Um, this can also be called assemblage. Assemblage is the process of bringing individual objects together to form a larger work, right? Just assembling, you can think of it as. Jeff Koons is a kitschy kind of artist. You, may, you might have heard of him. He also does other large uh, balloon puppy sculptures. Um, he's very famous for kind of these almost silly, kind of disgustingly silly, which is kind of kitschy recreations of commodity culture and cutesy things. Um, one of his most ambitious, probably, projects was Puppy. You see it here. He did a variety of different puppies. It consists of a stainless steel armature with uh, uh, irrigation lines inside of it. So, like, basically, it's water. You can turn on the hoses, and it'll water itself. And then these are all live flowering plants. Um, there's 70,000 flowers here and uh, 23 tons of soil that the artist put together. Um, Students love this piece. Every semester, people are like, that dog was so cool um, because it's a living sculpture, right? It's also site specific and it's also an installation. These are other terms we'll talk about in just a moment. Here's a picture of the artist himself uh, installing the work. So you can see this framework uh, where he actually placed all the flowers, uh, different flowers, um, specifically in little pods where the soil was. Um, uh, you can also find other, so this one, uh, so it is, there's one in New York, there, uh, there's, um, this one is the one in um, Spain, and um, there's also one, I, I don't know if this one is still there, um, it was an installation, I think it was taken out, but this one is in France. So um, really an interesting kind of work that gets us thinking about sculpture on a large scale and as an assemblage of objects brought together. That's also here site specific. That means it needs to be in this site to function. This brings us to the idea of environments as well. So environments are sculptural spaces in which viewers can enter or visually explore. Um, we won't go over any environments today, um, but they are covered slightly in your textbook readings. Um, these also can be thought of as installations. We're gonna look at earthworks as well. These are large scale outdoor environments. Um, made from the land. Um, some of you might have been to Marfa in North Texas where those um, tunnels, those big um, 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 uh, minimalist artworks are out in the desert up there. Um, that would be called an earthwork. Um, Site-specific works were also made to transform a particular space. And as I said, this is um, of course a site-specific work as well and an installation. You can use these terms kind of overlapping in a lot of ways. Let's look at a couple key earthworks. Um, so an earthwork is an in introduction of a work of art into an un unexpected environment. Uh, it's transformative, causing us to readjust our expectations for art. Let's look at Spiral Jetty. Um, this is a minimalist work by, uh, by Robert uh, Smithson from the 1970s. This is in the Great Lake, uh, the, uh, the Great Salt Lake of U at Utah in Utah, if any of you ever get there. Um, Smithson brought in rock and moved, basically <laughs> moved in um, tons of rock and uh, salt crystals, uh, earth, red water, uh, algae, you can see around it. Um, it changes every time you see it um, based on the conditions to basically make this huge spiral in the lake. Um, it's hard to tell how big it is, but you can drive a car onto this. So it's very, very large. And this is a perfect example of uh, earthworks. It's made out of mud, salt, crystals, rocks, and water. Um, as I said, it also, you know, the water's included in it because it surrounds it. 
and sometimes covers it. It's a spiral shape, which was uh, one of the most kind of uh, recognizable shapes in nature that we see through, uh, throughout and uh, across cultures. And the really cool thing about earthworks is they're meant to be outside. You know, the, um, in art, we talk a lot about don't touch this, don't touch that. Um, well, in earthworks, it's really cool because um, they're just out in the elements. And so the part of the idea of installing an artwork is the idea that it will change over time. It will probably disintegr de uh, disintegrate over time and just go away completely. Like this, you know, has not been um, uh, worked on since the 1970s. It is still there, but it looks differently as in, it changes all the time. Um, it's basically a land bridge out into the lake. So it's a salt lake, right? Um, and it does get cold there as well. So here you can see uh, the salt deposits built up on it. So it looks white. You can see that here too. At certain times of the year, the water turns pink because of like the chemical reaction with the salts and the clay. Um, so sometimes the water looks pink around it. Sometimes it looks blue when it's reflecting the sky more. Sometimes uh, you can see the actual brown rock uh, that has been brought in. And of course it snows and gets ice around it too. So it's changing all the time. And so this is, when we think about time-based art, this one works for that as well, because over time it is constantly changing um, because it is part, now it is part of the earth. And now I wanna talk about living sculpture. I will focus on a few artists here. Um, so artists have also thought of their bodies as sculptural. Um, here you have Yoko Ono, who many of you might know from the Beatles because she was dating John Lennon for a long time. They were partners. Um, but before him and, you know, before he met her, before, you know, he was even that big of a deal, she was a performing artist who was very well known. Um, so here you have a piece of hers called Cut Piece. Um, this is a piece that where she basically uh, was on a stage. Uh, she invited people to come in and she had was fully clothed and people were invited. The audience was invited to come up and cut part of her clothing off. And so she was thinking herself of herself as a, a living sculptor, you know, time-based as well. It's a good term for this well, as well. So over time, um, she is the living sculpture changes as she slowly becomes nude. Um, and of course, this is a very vulnerable piece, you know, giving someone else a sharp object to then use to cut off your clothing. You know, any psycho could have, you know, stabbed her with it, um, which is really crazy. Um, so thinking about all these things. And then for her, it was um, thinking about kind of the potentially aggressive act of unveiling the female body, which, you know, historically, the female body, the female nude in the history of art has been seen as kind of a neutral subject, uh, one that doesn't do much. So here she's act, kind of in, enacting that history um, uh, using her body. Now this is another very interesting uh, performance piece in which the artist actually used uh, their bodies. Uh, you, some of you might have heard of Marina Abramovich and Ule, um, they were partners at the time, they were partners working together as performing artists for decades. Um, they hear in this work that's called Imponderabilia um, from the 70s, they basically, and this was not planned by the museum, the museum did not invite them to do this, but they basically went to this museum of modern art in Bologna in Italy and were naked and stood in a doorway that was really small like this and Everyone knew they were artists and they were performing artists, um, but it was not invited by the gallery. And so people who entered the gallery through this door had to make a decision. Who do you face? Do you face the naked woman or the naked man? And then, you know, if you're facing one of them, your back is to the other one and your butt is rubbing against them and it's all sorts of kind of awkward feelings that you might have, um, and which was meant to be that way. And here where we have Yoko Ono, uh, engaging the viewer and allowing the viewer to be part of the piece. We also have that having, uh, happening here with this performance art. So you, the space in between them basically becomes the piece of art um, as we measure the uh, interactions between them and the viewers who can't just be viewers, right? They actually have to be participators. 
The performance was halted after 90 minutes. The police came and said, you can't do this, but it is documented in film and in photographs, as you see here. So again, using the body as a sculptural object. Now, the next piece I want to look at um, is a, uh, this piece that I'm showing you here. And it's an example of how artists can begin to kind of explore the medium in a variety of different ways. So I want you to listen to the noises that you're hearing. You real quick. So um, basically there, if you come to see this play, this piece, this is a piece that was actually like a box that was made by the artist, uh, Robert Morris. He uh, basically recorded himself making the box, all these noises, saws, nailing, you know, it's a beautiful box, right? But the part of the piece that's almost perhaps more interesting is not the physical object, but the sounds that you're hearing and the process that you are becoming aware of. This is about a three hour, uh, this took about three hours um, to com completely uh, create this box and make it all look all nice like this. Um, and so you have this recording that goes along with it, which think, makes us think about the artistic process as well. Here's some notes on it. Sound is sculpture, process is sculpture. It's referencing itself, right? Its own making. Um, now this is just the last piece that I wanted to focus on today. It is by Janine Antoni. It's called Na. Um, what do you think that these are? These are sculptures. Obviously, I can't hear you. Um, but hopefully, you're, you know, students usually say, hmm. So maybe, um, I'm not sure. Well, this is a giant piece of chocolate, 600 pounds of chocolate. It used to be a chocolate cube. Um, this is 600 pounds of lard. It used to be a cube as well. And now the, uh, the sculpture is called Na Sculptures. It's a series. What she's done is over three months, she basically gnawed at this chocolate, eating it, right? and gnawed at the lard, eating it, but hopefully spitting it out. Um, so the artist's process, again, and her body um, are parts of this piece. You can see she's even kind of scratched at it with her fingers. So her body is part of the piece, even though it's not, it's invisibilized. You can't see it here. But you can see the imprint of the artist's body on these sculptural pieces. And you'd say that these are additive or subtractive? Subtractive, right? So she created a big cube of chocolate and then slowly subtracted as she ate it um, over the series of three months. And then this is what we have. So really, really interesting stuff happening here, more experimental. And she's actually referencing the history of um, minimalist artists who worked in the 60s and also made giant cubes and put them in the gallery and said, this is my art, right? It's minimal, minimalists. We'll talk about them much more later in the course. But she's referencing them and then kind of like flipping that on its side and actually engaging with it, with the cube, with her body by gnawing away at it. Here's another piece of hers called Lick and Lather. Now that you know that she's up to, you might understand what's going on here. Uh, these are busts, which mean basically a sculpture of her, um, of her head, um, of her. Um, yes, these are chocolate busts and these are actually soap. 
So what she's done here, if you look closely, and there's a long history of um, sculptural busts in the history of art. You know, this is just from uh, the, that museum I showed you earlier, um, uh, the, the Academy in, uh, in Florence, Italy. Um, long history there, and she's working with that history and then making these busts of herself out of soap and then using them to actually lather herself during her baths for months and you can see what happens to soap, right? When you're using the soap, it slowly disintegrates, right? So that's happening here with these as well. Over time, uh, the busts are completely smoothed out. And same goes for the chocolate, right? She's licked it over and over and over, using her body, engaging with the piece with her body um, to kind of form it and then sub, you know, applying the subtractive uh, process as she takes away, but also eats at the same time. So it's this very kind of interesting um, and innovative way of using sculpture in the present. And she's working in the 90s. She still works today, though. Um, that's as, mu as much as I need to share today. There's a lot more in the other course material in the folder. Um, but I hope you have a great one. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you soon.